every country has its treasure trove of beloved tales. But one nation has an unrivaled passion for storytelling. For 10 centuries, Icelanders have been enthralled by a series of homespun stories. They're some of the most wonderful tales ever told. How they came to be written is one of the great mysteries of the Dark Ages. A thousand years ago, at the edge of the Arctic Circle, there was an explosion of creativity which remains pretty much unparalleled in history. When the Vikings came here to Iceland, one of the first things they did, strangely, was to settle down and begin telling each other tales. These sagas, as they're now known, are some of the greatest stories ever told. They're haunted by ghosts and plagued by witches. Mighty heroes ride to the rescue, wielding magical swords. The sagas captivated audiences 10 centuries ago, and they're still entertaining millions of people today. They're about money and sex and, you know, and death. And this is just, you know, the essence of good story, sex and death. This is probably the greatest book ever written. You know, this is a magnificent story. Both has everything good novels is supposed to have. She has love and, and bottle and great poet and everything. It's everything in there. The sagas are not only great works of fiction, they're based on the lives of real people, and they challenge many of the stereotypes of the Viking Age. They reveal the power Scandinavian women wielded. They were explorers and colonizers. They may even have written some of the sagas. Iceland's ancient tales also had a profound effect on us. The sagas influenced many of Britain's greatest writers, and inspired some of our most treasured stories. Son Bjarnar Bönu, han var hersir ríkur í Noregi og kynsæll. Á ofanverðu dögum Ketils hófst ríki Haralds konus hárfagra. Svo að engir fylkis konungar þrifist í landinu fyrir honum, ni annað stórmenni nema hann eitir í þeirra nafbóndum þeirra. Þetta varð að ráði. Því að síðan í Ketils fyrsti mjög fararinnar og enginn mælti í móti. This is how great stories begin. With a journey, a quest, a search for a promised land. And so it is with the sagas. They recount the moment when Norwegian exiles set sail in their longships. They defied the wild oceans to found a brave new world. They named it Iceland. I wonder what the first settlers here in Iceland thought when they arrived. It's the least likely of promised lands, certainly the strangest place I've ever been to. It feels primeval, like a woolly mammoth should come lumbering along the horizon. There's nothing growing here, there's no trees or crops. And under the ground, there's no iron ore or gold. And yet these hardy pioneers didn't just turn tail and sail off in their longboats. They stayed and tried to create something out of this extraordinary landscape. 
And what they created was truly magical. Words. Iceland is where Europe ends and the Arctic begins. It's more than 700 miles northwest of Scotland, remote, far flung, isolated. But when it comes to the world of words, this country has always been one of the centres of literary activity. One in ten Icelanders is a published author, and this love of letters began long ago with the writing of the sagas. I think uh, all modern Icelandic writers, they have their background in this, one way or the other. During the centuries, we didn't have any universities, no mm. academies. And we didn't have many uh, uh, types of arts. No architecture, no, uh, no theatres, no music, no opera, no sculptures, mm. no ballet, of course. Maybe if you look at our history, this is the only thing that we have ever been good at. It's writing stories and telling stories. The greatest of these stories are known as the family sagas. They're set in the first 150 years of Iceland's history, from the original settlement in 870 AD. The sagas were written down in the 13th and 14th centuries. In just over 100 years, dozens and dozens of stories were composed. It's a creative outpouring that has few parallels in history. Well, it was very, very remarkable that such a lot of, uh, su such a, a large volume of literature should come um, out of this really relatively tiny, uh, t tiny island with, you know, really a very small population. But remarkable too is the, the genres, the forms of this literature. While the rest of medieval Europe was writing courtly romances about knights and princesses, the Icelanders were creating dramas about real families, in real locations, doing real things. The thing that they're most like, actually, is much, much later 19th century novels. They're, they're, um, they're in prose, they're naturalistic, they, they um, deal with social issues, so they're, they're big, expansive narratives. You see something that is so much in common with our time and, and this time. So you feel, wow, this is really human. That's how human being is. Exactly. You know, you get something you're like, ah, we have not changed mm -hmm. in a way. I know this. Yeah. It, it's yeah. like peep into a hole, into <laughs> exactly. a past and say, they're doing the same thing. <laughs> they are, of course, about, in essence, always about the very primitive uh, thing. They are about the inner circle in human action, about, you know, lust and power and, and fight, and they're about, you know, they're about the, the glue that, that binds us. Out of the many sagas that were written, four or five are classics, but there's one in particular that's always intrigued me. We all love a good story, but who'd have thought when you're flicking through a book at bedtime or lying reading on the beach, that this is where it all began, one of the first great works of fiction. The pages may be blackened by the passage of time, but despite being over 700 years old, the story still leaps out at you. It's got everything a good book needs, love and lust, violence, betrayal and revenge. It's called Laxdala Saga, and in my opinion, it's the greatest of the Icelandic sagas. Laxdala means Salmon River Valley, and it's in the rich farming and fishing country of northwest Iceland that the story takes place. The Laxdala saga charts the fortunes of the families who settle in the area. It follows their triumphs and tragedies over several generations. The love affairs, the blood feuds, 
the marriages, the murders. The story is rooted in a timeless landscape. It's still possible to pinpoint the fells and fjords where key events occurred. This sense of place underpins the relationship between Icelanders and their ancient stories. This happens in my area. These characters are my forefathers, and, and I, they are still in my mind as they, they, you know, I know the farmers who live on their farm, right. and I've found a similarity to them. I don't think we have so much change since this time. We are still the same farmers as we were in these days. And I almost imagined myself when I was, for example, taking sheep down from the mountains. I was uh, sometimes thinking about these things that they have done. I'm in the same steps as they were, and they were there and there and there. You start Black Styler Saga with a portrait of the great matriarch, Unnur, and her nickname is the Deep-Minded. What does the Deep-Minded mean? Clever, wise, with a huge memory, philosophical. What a wonderful epithet. What a surprising, maybe, epithet for, for, for a, 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 a woman in, in, in a saga, the Deep-Minded. Eptirthat. <laughs> For hon um atla breitha fjarða dalli, og nam sér lund svo viða sem hann vildi. Síðan hélt hún nur skipi sínu í fjarða botnin. Hann lætur bæreisa, þar er síðan heitir í kvammi og byggði þar. Many of the characters in the sagas are real people. The moments of high drama can be traced to genuine historical events. And few moments are more dramatic than the discovery of a new land. So who are the first settlers in this area then? Uh, that was Öder, the deep-minded. Öder Djúpug, as we call it on Iceland. Uh -huh. she, she, was, uh, she, she came sailing up this bay and had settlement over there, by the other end of the bay. She settled there on a farm called Kvammur. So it was a woman? <laughs> it was a woman, yes. Ah, tell me a bit about her then. She, was, uh, she, she probably came here on the year of 892. She, she came from Scotland. Uh, that, uh, she, what happened is that her husband went into battle there and he died. And, and she had to go away with her crew. And, and she established a crew on her boat, made the boat ready, at, uh, so nobody, uh, nobody was supposed to know it. And then she sailed away from Scotland. She was, uh, what you say, running away from there. But, but that was a magnificent that a woman could do that on those, those days. So, she, so the first settler in this area is a woman. Yeah. And she's Scottish. Yes. And she's able to control a boatload of men. Yes. Command. And then what happened when she got here then? She, she settled down in, in this farm called Kvammur. And, and what she did is that she gave her crew, all the men got uh, independency. They, they, they lived here in this area, in this Dallas Isla area. We can imagine that she must have been at least a very big woman, very big minded. You know, can imagine that she, she must have been very clever and she must have been very fair. She was fair to people. She gave everybody with her. So she must have been, what you do, as you say, very big woman in mind. She must have been a great woman. Wonderful, gosh. And it, she earns the title, I'm the deep-minded. Yes, yes. It's a good, it's a very apt one, isn't it? It tells a lot yeah. about her. Is it really possible that a thousand years ago, a British woman colonised part of Iceland? It sounds like the stuff of adventure fiction, not historical fact. But recent archaeological evidence actually supports the story told in the Laxdella saga. This is the skeleton of one of the first settlers in Iceland. She's a woman, only 25 years old when she died. She was probably someone's wife, mother, daughter. She's here in a position of rest, just as she was laid in the ground a thousand years ago. 
And it was at precisely this time that the Laxdala saga was being composed. But is there any truth to these tales that Iceland was settled by foreign women? Well, DNA studies on bones just like this have shown that while the majority of the male population were coming over from the Nordic homelands and Scandinavia, over 60% of the women were British. So this evidence shows us that right from the word go, Iceland was a multicultural melting pot. The story of Un the Deep-Minded shows us how close the links were between Iceland and the British Isles. Both countries were staging posts in a maritime empire which stretched from Norway right across the North Atlantic and beyond. Here we have a collection of silver coins discovered in Iceland and dated to the turn of the first millennium. But what's really remarkable about this collection is the majority of coins are English. At this point, around the year 1000, over two thirds of the British Isles was ruled directly by Vikings. And here we have a payment known as the Dangeld, which was made by the English kingdoms to the Vikings in order to keep them off their land. But we've also got coins here from Germany and Arabia and the Middle East, which shows that the Vikings were also raiding, trading and settling right across the known world. The Viking Age began in the 8th century. Over the next 300 years, they raided, traded and settled, leaving a profound mark on Europe and especially the British Isles. Well, I suppose the most obvious effects are, are on place names. I mean, so many place names in, in northern and eastern England. Just thinking about where I grew up, there were Thornaby, Ormsby, Normanby. The language, of course, um, that's even more obvious, if you like. Um, the, the Scandinavian loan words are very basic words. So they're words like husband, window, law, egg, and even the pronoun system in English is derived from Scandinavian pronouns. So they, them, their. They're, they're derived from the Scandinavian pronouns, not from the, the corresponding Old English ones. The Scandinavian settlements resulted in a thorough enrichment of English society. The Vikings who settled Britain had to fit in alongside other people. But the Scandinavians who sailed to Iceland found an uninhabited land. Here, the Vikings had to build a new nation from scratch. And what they created was unique for the Dark Ages. very significant place aren't we it's got geographical and political and spiritual significance can you tell me a little bit more about it this is the um, site of the Althingi the early um, uh, meeting place of the uh, Icelandic Commonwealth uh -huh. where people came from all over the country to uh, discuss legal matters formulate a new law mm. and uh, settle disputes mm. so history more or less happened in this location This is a parliament that the settlers come up with here after a few decades of living in the country as a free man. And um, they sit here in a very sort of structured uh, uh, assembly that uh, has a democratic um, function in a way for uh, free farmers and males and, um, and uh, decide by voting. Is it unusual in terms of what, what's going on elsewhere in Europe at this time? Uh, in terms of European history, this mm. is uh, quite unique because mm. they don't have a king, they mm. don't have a centralised power. Yeah. And that is the beauty of the system. 
uh, you have uh, independent uh, chieftains coming together and they decide on something and uh, execute whatever is uh, decided. Iceland has set up a nation from about from, from 870 onwards and they set up a parliament and they set up a legal system. I mean, in a way, I think perhaps that the, that the outpouring of literature um, that, that you get in Iceland, this huge flowering of not just sagas but also um, uh, unique kinds of poetry, I think maybe that was part of being a new nation, that you had a terra nova and you didn't only um, settle that and build it up as a nation socially, you also um, inscribed a kind of literary culture. The first things that were written were um, family trees, tracing the Icelanders back to very noble people in Scandinavia. And I think one of the reasons they did this may have been that there were rumors in, in our uh, neighboring countries about the people that moved to Iceland nice. in the years of around 900 or 1000 were mostly anti-social elements, thieves, fugitives, murderers, people that didn't survive around civilized people. So maybe the first reaction was when they had this alphabet and could write down, they were building these family trees saying that this was the most noble people because all Icelanders, they can trace their roots back to kings and yeah. queens and, and even uh, Odin and Thor and, and so on. For some, storytelling may have served an even more profound function, reminding them of the homes and loved ones which they would never see again. While a few British women, like Anne the Deep-Minded, chose to settle in Iceland, others were brought by force. One of the next characters we meet in the Laxdella saga is a concubine. Today, we call her a sex slave. She's been abducted from Ireland. Her name is Melkorka. Most of the women, they were uh, bought either in slave markets in Scandinavia or uh, brought directly from the British Isles, mostly from Ireland. Of course, when they came here, they became a part of the population and the male culture, the Scandinavian male culture, became dominant, the language and so on. But they had an experience for, for uh, generations of telling stories in their own language and even writing books in their own language, the Celts, the Book of Celts and so on. There's something really interesting taking place in Icelandic literature then. You've got this male population with the oral tradition of storytelling combined with this influx, this exodus of women coming from Britain. So the Celtic influence could be this idea that you take that literature and then write it down. Absolutely, it. absolutely. Foreign women like Melkorka weren't just characters in the sagas. These lonely, literate exiles may have helped create the sagas by writing down their stories. In the Laxdella saga, we find out that Melkorka, the Irish slave girl, is pregnant by her master, a Viking called Hoskuld. <laughs> Þótti honum sem fleirum hann hefði ekki vætna barn séð eins nýja stórmannlegra. Höskuldur var spurður hvað sveitnin skildi heita. Hann bað sveinin kalla Ólaf. Ólafur var afbrað flestra barna. Höskuldur lagði mikla ást við sveinin. Olaf is a major character in the early part of the saga. 
He's kind and wise. He marries and raises a family. Olaf has one child that he dotes upon, a boy called Kjartan. Han var allra manna friðastur þegar að fæst hafa á Íslandi. Han var mikil leitur og vel farinn í andliti. Han var manna best eigður og ljós litaður. Mikið hár hafði hann og fagurt sem silki og ljokkar fjallu með. Mikill maður og sterkur. Olaf also has another lad, a foster son by the name of Botley. Botley is a gifted child, but he grows up in Kjartan's long shadow. Olaf's family and farm are flourishing. All is going well. Rather too well, of course. It's at this point that a new and sinister character enters the story. Sorcery is ever present in the sagas, reflecting the Viking belief that magic really could transform the lives of ordinary folk. Minni mæðu flýðu frá Fjandi ótta bundin. Aldrei skuli fundin. Today we modern people we we often look at magic as some kind of superstitions. Uh, it's difficult for us to understand it uh, because we live in another time and perhaps in another world in a way. Uh, but for them, that was a real thing. They knew, they, they, they knew that they could achieve something um, by doing some rituals, and they, with that they could affect the world around them, both in good and bad ways, of course. In a way, it was uh, uh, very much practical uh, magic to uh, let the cow milk more uh, magics to let the grass grow faster. And uh, therefore, uh, people had some kinds of magics uh, that could, could uh, help them to, to, uh, to look more positive in, in, in the coming days and, and have extra power to, to, uh, to uh, uh, survive. But sorcery could also be used to maim and kill. For Vikings, curses were weapons of malign magical power. The word in Iceland has always been the most important thing in, 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 in the whole culture. Um, um, people believed that if, if you had the power to control um, the, the, the language and, and, and put the words in, uh, out of your mouth in, in the right order, then uh, it, it could give you actually a more power. Það læt ég þá um mælt að þetta sverð Verði þeim manni að bana í yðar ætt er mestur skaði komi að og óskaplegast komi við. Botley inherits the cursed sword and with the handing over of the weapon, the story takes a new turn. The focus shifts to Kjartan and Botley and a beautiful young woman with whom their fate will be intertwined. Who 
Guðrún var kvenna vænst er upp oxi á Íslandi, bæði að ásjónu og vitsmönnum. Guðrún var kvörteiskona, svo að í þann tíma þóttu allt barnavípur er aðrar konur höfðu í skarti hjá henni. Hún var best orði farin og kvenna kænst. Hún var örlind kona. There are many leading ladies, but towering above them all is Gudrun, a complex and tempestuous beauty. The number of strong women characters is a striking feature of the Lax de la Saga. So too is the delight the writer takes in clothes and jewellery, love and romance. And this has led some historians to question the authorship of the saga. So we think that probably the traditional view of the sagas is that they're very heroic tales, they're written by men, for men and starring men. Mm -hmm. Is that the case with Lax de la Saga? No, I think it's the other way around. Ah. I'm an Icelandic scholar. Professor Helga Kress has suggested that the writer, the, 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 the one who wrote down Black Style of Saga, was a woman. There are so many scenes in that book that tell you about women's lives. It must have been told by women and listened to by women. And you see, up to the time of television probably, you would have storytelling evenings in Iceland, in the farmhouse. You have this long winter months, eight or nine months, and you have to pass the time. There's no telly. So, <laughs> you tell stories. You would have the people sitting on those benches on both sides of the longhouse. And you would have one person at the, in the middle reading or telling stories. Women's domain is within the house, the men's domain is without the house. So storytelling must have been a great part of life of women just as men. Absolutely. So we have this saga centred on women, possibly told by women, mm -hmm. about women, women's roles within mm -hmm. society. Definitely, I would say so, mm. yes. This is the site of one of the greatest romances in all of Icelandic literature. It's the hot spring at the tiny hamlet of Laugar. Laugar is Gudrun's home, and it's at this spa that Kjartan and Gudrun begin their courtship. Gudrun falls passionately in love, but Kjartan is a true Viking. He's consumed not by love, but by lust. Wonderlust. With marriage beckoning, he ups sticks and leaves Iceland. Kjartan and Botli sail away to Norway. They arrive in Scandinavia at a pivotal moment in European history. Take a look at this amazing little object. This man just oozes character. He's got a flamboyant moustache, deep penetrating eyes and really strong features. He's wearing this conical hat and he's sitting on a chair holding a very weird looking object. But when we take a closer look, you can see that the hat is in fact a crown. He's seated on a throne and the object could be either an upside down crucifix or the hammer wielded by the pagan god Thor as he creates thunder. This wonderful little man encapsulates the moment when the Viking world has one foot in the pagan past and one in the Christian future. This is a ceremony to mark the end of summer and the beginning of winter. It's the last remnant of a once mighty faith, the religion of Odin and Thor, Norse paganism. <clears throat> the word paganism comes with many negative connotations. 
it might seem odd, peculiar, perhaps even a little sinister, but that's because for 2,000 years, Christians have been writing tracts and treaties that down these so-called pagans to hell. In fact, for thousands of years, this Norse paganism was the religion of the Scandinavian people. It helped them make sense of the universe. It acted as a comforter to them in times of need. And it even helped them chart the passage of time. It's a mark of its influence that it's still doing this today. A thousand years ago, this ancient religion was under attack from a new crusading faith, Christianity. The man who was driving the conversion of the Vikings was Olaf, the king of Norway. Were there reasons then for converting to Christianity? What were the benefits? Uh, basically joining the European Union. <laughs> Basically yeah. the same thing. Right, because so it was trade? And... Yeah, it was trade because the markets were closing down. <laughs> uh, we could no longer do trade with England because mm. uh, uh, they would not accept pagans. I mean, uh, uh -huh. And uh, for a period of years, uh, people could do what they called prime signing, which was uh, uh, basically uh, crossing yourself be before you did commerce. But, but that was no longer accepted. Uh, Denmark was basically uh, very strongly Christian. Uh -huh. uh, Norway had become Christian after a long bloody battle. Mm. Sweden was about to become Christian. So it was basically, everything was closing down. Yeah. So it was a very practical business decision. But many people didn't want to give up the faith of their ancestors. The Icelanders resisted Christianity. To make them convert, the Norwegian monarch, King Olaf, decides to keep Kjartan as a sort of VIP hostage. The king's sister, Ingibjörg, keeps Kjartan entertained. In medieval courtly romance, the hero would have escaped from Norway and returned to his true love. But what sets the family sagas apart is their realism. What's so surprising is that the characters are archetypal kind of human. It's so easy to identify with the characters. I mean, sometimes deceptively easy. We forget how very different their circumstances and beliefs and cultural traditions were. But the characters in family sagas um, are, are, are their feelings and their failings, their hopes and their fears, their, their passions and, and, and their weaknesses. They're very easy to identify. Kjartan is not only beautiful and good, you know, he's also, he, come on, he's doing the princess in, in, in Norway and he's not a, a holy figure or a holy guy. All the literature in Europe is very Christian in that sense that there are martyrs, there are good guys and there are bad guys mm -hmm. and, and good things happen to good guys and bad things happen to bad guys. Mm -hmm. In the sagas, this is not so. The sagas can be about bad guy, an asshole, <laughs> that does something very bad to everybody and has success with it. Kjartan is happy to stay in Norway, but Botley wants to go home. Before he leaves, he criticizes Kjartan for the way he's treating Gudrun. Og myndi ég býða þín í næsta vetur ef að sumri væri lauslegra um þínar ferðir en nú. En vér þykjumst hitt skilja að konungur vill fyrir enga muni þig lausan láta. Og höfum það verið satt að þú munir nú fátt það er til skemmtanar er á Íslandi Þá er þú situr á tali við Ingibjörg og konungssystur. Botley arrives home. He tells Gudrun about Kjartan's affair with the king's sister. 
The reason for his anger with Kyatan now becomes clear. Botley is in love with Gudrun. A few months later, he takes a fateful step and proposes. In the year 1000, Iceland finally converts to Christianity. Kjartan is free to return home. He brings with him a wedding gift, a priceless headdress for his fiancée, Gudrun. Kjartan has the bridal gift, but not the bride. He marries another woman, but he's consumed by what he sees as a double betrayal. There were regular feasts in the area, so the two couples, Botley and Gudrun, and Kjartan and his new wife, couldn't avoid each other. Whenever they met, Kjartan publicly humiliated Gudrun, and he spurned Botley's attempts at reconciliation. With each slight, the hatred grew. The precious headdress that was supposed to have been Gudrun's was now the property of Kjartan's new wife, and this headdress became the focus of the feud. One particular feast, the headdress goes missing. Everyone suspects it's Gudrun's doing. If she can't have it, then no one can. With the destruction of the headdress, Kjartan's pent-up fury explodes. He barricades Botley and Gudrun in their home, cutting them off from the toilets which are outside. He's deliberately inflicting maximum humiliation. Revenge is the kind of engine of quite a lot of saga narrative because obviously um, uh, 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 if you get a feud, for instance, um, that's going to kind of keep on through generations, for instance, resentments build up. In a number of family sagas, it's these proud, uh, independent women who are pushing the vengeance and it's quite often the men who are trying to kind of damp it down by due legal process and make settlements, and the women are inciting the violence. As in Laxdala Saga, Gudrun provoking Botley to kill Kjartan because she can't bear not to be married to him. Goaded on by his wife, Botley and his men ride out to confront Kjartan. So, Siggy, the tension is really mounting in the saga now, isn't it? Um, Gudrun has goaded her brothers and Botley to ambush Kjartan. And then, then what happens? This is the place where everything happened. Uh -huh. Kjartan was coming from this direction with his friend. He was coming from Sörpær. And, and Botley and the brother of Gudrun, they came from this direction. And probably they picked up this place because they, the valley is, is slimmest here. And um, probably they were staying, or we think that they were staying up there in the hill, uh, on the rats there. There is a hole down there, very deep hole, and they could hide themselves with the horses and having uh, look to both directions easily. So when, when Chartan is in this direction, they saw that they could fight him. And then they went down here and, and attacked him, of course. They were attacking him, three or four, attacking one person. So it must have been a lot of noise with weapons. They were three, four, attacking one person. A lot of sweat, probably some blood, because Kjartan was punishing them a little bit with his sword, and it was a bad sword, so you can imagine that he got tired, for example. You can imagine that it was a uh, lot of, of high breathing, and they were, they were tired. Kjartan fights bravely, but finally he weakens. With his strength failing, he turns and addresses Botley. Það 
sæk ég þá um mælt. Að þetta sverð verði þeim manni að bana í yðar ætt er mestur skaði að og óskaflega. Enginn veitti bolli svör máli kjartans, en þó veitti hún bana sál. Bolli settist þegar undir herðar honum og andaðist kjartan í knjáum bolla. Eðras bolli þegar verksins og lísti vígi á hendu sér. Blood has been shed. The curse of Legbiter has been fulfilled. All this sorcery and violence and vengeance has led to this, a bloodied corpse lying on the ground. Botley has killed his brother and his best friend. He's broken two of the great Viking taboos by severing the sacred bonds of friendship and family. What must he be feeling right now? Intense guilt profound shame, or perhaps a sense of deep foreboding, because the wheels of revenge have now been set in motion. A posse tracks down Botley and slaughters him. Gudrun sends her son to avenge his murder. Both families are trapped in a bloody spiral of revenge. It seems that the feud might go on forever, but then the saga takes an unexpected twist. Gudrun, the woman who has helped send Kjartan and Botli to early graves, converts to Christianity and becomes Iceland's first nun. It's an unlikely act of repentance. Was it genuine or not? I, I'm not sure, I don't know. But I do think that's, you know, perhaps those who told the story, the audience may like the flair of that. Perhaps, you know, it's a way for the, for the author or the authors, if you can say that, that, you know, this, perhaps this woman was just, you know, there was no one worthy of her but the King of Kings. Gudrun's repentance sent out an important social message. In the 13th century, when the Lax de la Saga was being written down, the Republic had disintegrated. Iceland was racked by civil war, and this may have persuaded the writers to pen an overtly Christian ending. Some chieftains are getting more powerful than they should be, according to the quota system for power and influence that was set up in the beginning, mm. and um, they seem to long for peace in the texts that we uh, have. So the mm. saga texts, they are written with the idea in mind to show how Christianity brought peace to the country. What gets them into problem is their uh, pagan ethics right. and uh, the cult of ethics that tells you that you have to take revenge and one revenge after another and leads to more death. And um, <clears throat> in the text you see that Christianity is believed to bring peace and forgiveness into society, finally calming down the feuds, family feuds that have been going on for generations and you can just stop and uh, go to Rome and uh, be blessed and uh, live happily ever after. Peace came in 1262, but at a heavy price. The Icelanders were forced to accept the rule of the Norwegian king. 
It was the prelude to centuries of suffering. Things went downhill for the Icelanders. We were almost extinct because of, uh, of uh, diseases, starvation, isolation, and so on. And uh, you, uh, at that time, maybe one of the reasons that we survived, the few who did, was because they had this uh, mythology based in the literature. We were, we were taking all our uh, courage and all our identity from the, the sagas. This was what we based our hope and, uh, and ambitions on. Ironically, just when Iceland's pain was most acute, Britain was discovering the great stories Iceland had produced. In the 18th century, the sagas reached our shores. They had a profound influence on one of our greatest poets. I think there's a very, very big influence actually on, on Blake's work. I, I mean, perhaps the, the, one of the most characteristic things about, about Blake's poetry, and, and one of the most notoriously difficult things really, is that he, he has um, created this huge and hectic mythological world. This, he's created a kind of alternative Blakean mythology so many of Blake's poems contain elements derived from Old Norse myth. That's very significant, I think. By the 19th century, more and more writers were borrowing from Norse literature. Britain was hooked on the romance and heroism of the Viking Age. Victorian entrepreneurs, industrialists and explorers I had a kind of fellow feeling with, with what they saw as, as the Viking achievement, that is the exploring, the white heat, the, the white heat of technology, the, the new ships, the, the, the seafaring, the great ships of the, of, of the Vikings, and that sense of independence and, and, and taking your fate in your own hands and, and getting ahead and so on. The influence of Icelandic literature reached its high watermark in the 20th century in the work of one famous Oxford academic. Tolkien taught Old Norse, Tolkien published on Old Norse, um, and Tolkien's imaginative world was, was surely shaped by his reading of Old Norse. And the Lord of the Rings, he definitely uses names that he's called from his Old Norse reading. Actually, the Silmarillion, which people don't read so much, echoes more some of the themes of, 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 of the sagas, this <laughs> more, more betrayal and, and, and darkness in the Silmarillion. So I think uh, Tolkien was really steeped in Old Norse literary culture. Through Tolkien, the world had woken up to the power of the ancient stories. But in Iceland, the sagas had never gone away Generation after generation had fallen in love with these strange, otherworldly tales. It's very unusual uh, in Britain for people to read such old literature and find it exciting still. Why is it the sagas are so exciting? Just the drama and the action, you know. A girl can't choose who he marries. If she wants someone and the brothers don't like him, <laughs> they say no. And if he doesn't understand, they kill him. <laughs> so I think it's the revenge and what they believe in. Mm. Because they believe in very strange things. Very strange things. What yeah. sort of things? Um, like um, when someone cheated on their wife, they like have to kill him and burn him and something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's enjoyable to read now uh, as well. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> I think it's just very interesting that we live the way they lived around the places that they did. Yeah, it's like learning about your ancestors mm. and what they did in the past. Yeah. Somebody cheats on your wife, mm -hmm. and they kill him. <laughs> it's just creepy. <laughs> it's mostly fun <laughs> to read, actually. The sagas were written to help the Vikings make sense of a bewildering new world.
thousand years later, they still serve the same purpose. As Icelanders come to terms with a country transformed by financial crisis, they're turning once more to their stories. Some years ago, we decided that we were the most brilliant international bankers of the world. It turned out to be uh, not so good. A myth. Yeah, it turned out to be a myth. But <clears throat> we have uh, 800 or 1,000 years of tradition of, of, uh, of uh, making literature. So, uh, and, uh, and uh, me, like uh, other writers, we, we go back to the circus to find our ideas for how to tell stories and even what to tell stories about. We are, of course, a small island in the north, and that's what we are famous for, are the writers and the books, the old books. I think that that's lies in the heritage of the Icelanders to read these books. The language and the words and the poetry, that's what our culture is, is about, having control over the world and, and the language. So therefore, the, the, the language for Icelanders, for example, is, uh, is the most important thing in the whole world. You feel that you are discovering something. You are seeing something. It's like mind openers. And you're like, you get a window into another world. And for me, it's a great thrill because this is a true window. There is something about the backgrounds of the stories and just the magic of good story, how good story works. A good story becomes a classic because it works. inspired being here in Iceland. I've been trying to work out what it is and I think the thing is that it's such a sparsely populated country, just a third of a million people, and it does feel very distant from the heart of Europe up here on the edge of the Arctic. But despite that, the people haven't developed an island mentality or turned in on themselves. In fact, they've done the opposite. They've gone out into the world, they've embraced the world, and they've given something back. For 10 centuries, they've been welcoming us into their homes and settling us down around their hearts and entertaining us with their stories. <laughs> <laughs>